tardes, amigos y amigas. ¿Cómo están todos? Bien, qué bueno, qué bueno. Me llamo Lucas Ochoa. Soy mexicano. Y mis padres son de Mexicali. Yo nací aquí, en El Centro, California. Does anybody know where the Imperial Valley is at? One of you, yes. <laughs> That's usually the, re the response. I want to tell you a story today. A story of how my Mexican family immigrated here to the United States and how they helped forge what it means to be a Mexican American. And I can talk about my family and, and different members of, of my family for hours. Today, I want to focus on my father's side of the family, my great-grandmother, and my grandfather, her son, Apolinar Nayo Ochoa. My family always believed in storytelling. That's just what it is. Whether it's waking up really early in the morning, smelling chorizo con huevo, and running down and, and, and trying to pour into a basket of pan dulce with some coffee and, and talking about the past and the present. Or some nights, we would gather around a fire pit and eat carne asada and try to, uh, try to scare each other as much as we could, talking about el cuicuy or, or la llorona. <laughs> Side note that la llorona, not to be confused with that movie that's coming out in April, that's an abomination. That's probably another TED talk that we <laughs> really well over. Our story begins in Navajoa, a northern village in Mexico in the 1900s during the Mexican Revolution War. Now, there were two generals that were fighting for the cause. In the south, you had Emiliano Zapata, and in the north, you had Pancho Villa. Well, my family comes from the Sonora region of, of Mexico, and in there is a city, Navajo. So, what did you do during the war? Well, everybody had to participate. Why? Because most of the people, most of the soldiers who were fighting, weren't soldiers. They were ranchers, farmers, simple people who wanted a better life. And so everybody had to participate. And so the story goes that a regiment entered the town of Navajoa, and you were to provide supplies, warmth, comfort, food, and whatnot, among other things. Even the women had a role to play. In fact, they were called Adelitas. Does anybody know what that is? That's it. That song, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Beautiful. That song is actually the anthem for the Mexican Revolution of the North, the Centurion of the North, Pancho Villa, as they used to call him. So what did an Adelita do? What, what were some of their responsibilities? Well, it, depending on your region, depending on the definition, can vary. Some people thought that they were banditas who would actually take up arms and fight alongside the men. Pretty awesome. Others, you could say that they would provide clothing and warmth and food, morale. And other times, you would provide companionship and intimacy. My great-grandmother was an Adelita. And you can call her whatever you want because she did hear those names. Prostitute, Cifre Cuenza. She heard it all. But the one thing you can't deny, the one thing you cannot take from her, is that she gave everything, every inch of her body, so that her children could prosper. And so it was told that one day a regiment came in, and a man by the name of Domingo Ochoa had relations with my great-grandmother. And nine months later, my grandfather, Apolinar Nayo Ochoa, was born. Nayo, my grandfather, didn't know his dad. We were told at a young age that 
He was killed in action several days after their rendezvous. Another story says that he was drunk and wandered off into Yaki territory and was killed. But whatever the case, whatever the reason, my grandfather and my great-grandmother grew up incredibly angry and bitter for the sacrifices that they gave for their family members. They had no support. And so one day, as a young man, my grandfather went up to my great-grandmother and said, ¿Por qué no vamos a los Estados Unidos? Why don't we go to the United States? And she looked at him and said, ¿Por qué te van a matar? They're going to kill you. ¿Por qué no le gustan? Because they don't like you. Maybe it had to do with the fact that as a little girl, she saw several family members lynched by American soldiers. Or maybe it had to do with the fact that night after night she was giving her body and her heart was broken by a man who would be gone several days after. But whatever the case may be, my grandfather as a young man longed for the United States. He wanted to become an American citizen so bad. Unfortunately, my grandmother great-grandmother, pulled him out of school at third grade, and thus ending his education journey. So, in 1958, my great-grandmother, Josefa, passed away. And three months after that, Polinat Nayo Ochoa took his family, and immigrated to the United States. I want to pause right there because as a Mexican-American today in our society, we have seen an increase in vitriol towards immigrants, Latinx, and people of color. Was my grandmother right? Did they not want us here? Did they want to hurt us? According to an NPR study on July 12, 2018, we have seen a 51% increase in vitriol rhetoric towards Latinos and Latinas, and that includes racial epithets, online cyberbullying, classroom racism, and some have reported physical threats and even death. Maybe she wasn't imagining things. And today, as a Mexican-American, I struggle. I get nervous. Not because of what my grandmother warned, but of the immigrants who are coming here. Immigration is what makes us great. How do I know? You can look to my family, but you can also look to students that I teach here. As a co-director of the Speech and Debate Team, one of the things that we focus on is the importance and the power of words. You have to be careful with words. Things like rat, vermin, disease, animals, putting them in zoos. You are not talking about people anymore. You are robbing people of their humanity. And that is a dangerous thing. I had two students last semester, prize students, amazing. One wanted to become a doctor, and the other one wanted to become a poet laureate and both were undocumented. And I tried to recruit them to the speech and debate team. And on the first day, they showed up, and I was so excited because of the opportunity that lies within the speech team. It's for everyone. But the next day, they told me that they were going to quit because they were terrified of being caught and sent back. And that broke my heart. Because here we are, we have a potential doctor in an immigrant who can potentially cure cancer. Or you have another student who wants to become a poet laureate whose words actually helped other students with suicidal ideation. Words have impact. It has meaning. And yet I hear many times on the news that we're being invaded that there is an onslaught of immigrants that should not be welcomed. Yet the numbers indicate that we have seen a decline in immigration. And I don't think that's a good thing, but those are the numbers. 
we have seen a significant decline in immigrants, specifically Mexicans. So I began to think, well, what is the view of immigrants here in the United States? Is it positive? Is it negative? Again, I looked at a few research, and sure enough, the research indicates that six in 10 Americans believe that immigration is a good thing. Yay! That's awesome. But is it enough? No. No, it's not. I'm here today because I want to urge you to decipher through the hateful rhetoric towards Latinos, Latinas, Latinx, and people of color. To understand that immigrants, when they come here, they're making us better. Because the struggles and the sacrifices that they have made in their countries is something that you want, that you value here. Because they're going to fight for us. What can you do? What can you do when many Latinos and Latinas are starting to believe that they don't have a place in our society? And at some point, too, I began to think, like, am I imagining this? Is this something where I am not doing enough? And look at that statistic. We have more doubt now than ever before. We've seen a 10% increase in people doubting their place here in American society. That's alarming. For me, the best way to combat this, the best way to feel and to prove that you're a better version of yourself is to help immigrants. You can visit the National Immigrant Justice Center and you can give something as small as a dollar to help with attorney fees. Because if children in cages isn't unsettling to you, then you need to check yourself, big time. You can give blankets, food, and toys for these children. It won't solve it, but it'll help them. If you don't have money, because I know we're in college, then perhaps speak out. Let your voice be heard. Call your local Congress people. They have views. They have ideas on how to help immigrants. See what you can do to offer and help the dialogue propel forward. And finally, if you want to, you can work with your churches and they can help those types of movements so that you can be a better human. You can find that we're more alike than we are different. I close today with the final part of my grandmother's story. Two years after she died, a letter was sent to my grandfather, and it read, Mi rey, my king, I know that there's nothing I can do that'll stop you from entering the United States. But when I found out that you now have grandbabies, that I have grandbabies, I'm even more scared than ever. Please protect my grandbabies so that they can have a better life than what we did. P.S. Let me know when you arrive in the United States so that I know our journey has begun. My grandfather never had an opportunity to respond to her because she had passed away. And he's since passed away and I figure why not here? This is our own fire pit. And so I just want to say to my grandmother, if she can hear me, that we made it. And we have a lot more work to do. And I'm going to do everything in my power to welcome as many people as I can so that your sacrifices that you gave to my grandfather with your body will not be in vain.